All right. Thank you for the introduction, by the way. That was really nice. Um, so, yes, I'm Joe Barnard. Uh, I run, uh, I founded a company called BPS.Space. Um, we develop um, amateur rocketry components that are focused on matching the pace of advancement in the real space industry. So, I mean, uh, almost all of you in this room are likely familiar with uh, the likes of SpaceX, Blue Origin, uh, Richard Branson's uh, Virgin Orbit companies, and uh, really what, what BPS.Space is trying to do is um, sort of match that pace. Um, I think there's a lot of room for really cool development um, here. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today. So uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on, on who I am and how I came to be doing this. Um, when, <laughs> when I was a kid, uh, I think like most of you, I loved model rocketry. I was fascinated by these things and sort of had this passion for engineering. Um, you can see there's a photo of me, my sister, and my dad with a massive Bowmark missile. Um, I think somewhere in Ohio, but, uh, and then there's me with my first model rocket, uh, not looking actually that excited about it, but I was. Um, going into high school, I started getting into programs like FIRST Robotics. Um, you can see in the bottom right, there's a, a robot that we built, and again, once, once again, that's the passion for engineering. This is, I, I just, like, can't get enough of building things, designing and building things. You can see with the top right, there's some... <laughs> Rocketry experiments, some of them went well, some of them did not. Uh, <laughs> uh, later on in college, I got into audio engineering. Um, different types of energy engineering, but still this, this continuous passion for, for building and fixing things. You can see these two videos. Um, I, I would often take home broken audio equipment from my high school uh, just so I could fix it for them and learn how it worked. Um, and so those are some time-lapse videos of that happening. And then when it came time to decide to go to college, I chose uh, the Berkeley College of Music to study uh, more of this audio engineering. Uh, here's some clips of working in a recording studio, working with, I worked with a lot of outboard gear, a lot of signal processing stuff, and uh, you can see some, some really cool, really nice sounding tape decks there too. Um, and so through college, I, I thought of other ways I could, I could use this passion for engineering, and I found videography actually. I found a way that I could uh, put more creativity into this, this passion. Um, so I started working in the film industry. I picked up a camera and sort of taught myself how to, how to do these things. And, um, and uh, I, it was another way to sort of be able to build these, these sets, these rigs, work with high-tech stuff. And, um, and then something happened. And I graduated. And I had a degree in music, which <laughs> notoriously makes not a whole lot of money for someone. And that's a photo of. It's a photo of just about the moment I realized what I had done. <laughs> uh, and uh, after graduating, I continued to work in the uh, film industry for a little while up in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and then something else happened. I saw this video on uh, also my Facebook feed um, uh, sometime after I had graduated. And I kind of thought it was fake at first. This doesn't look real, does it? Um, this is uh, back in 2014. This is SpaceX uh, at their development facility in McGregor, Texas. Um, this is their Falcon 9 Dev R rocket. I believe that's the name. And so right here, that what they're doing is they're testing uh, sort of the flight dynamics of, of propulsively landing one of these multi-story vehicles, this, these truly massive objects. Um, and so with that, that's kind of why it doesn't seem like it's real. And, and at, at, upon seeing this, I thought to myself, well, I have to, this is the next step. This is what I want to do. I want to work for these people and build these machines. I mean, just kind of like a little boy, like just wanting to build big machines. And, um, and I didn't know how I could do it. I had this degree from a music school, and it doesn't, that doesn't take you super far in aerospace. Um, and then I saw this video. This is in April of 2015. This is the CRS-6 landing, I believe. I actually could be wrong about that. Yeah, so this didn't go so well, but, but I, saw, I saw how close they got. I think a lot of us in this room probably saw how close they got and, and thought like, oh, they're going to do this. Like, this is happening. It's, it's, not, it's not fake anymore. It's not like a dream. This is, this is coming true. And I, so I saw this and I sort, of, I sort of knew what I had to do to get SpaceX's attention, to sort of to show them that I could teach myself these concepts instead of, um, instead, of, instead of going back to engineering school 
spending a lot of money and, and, and more time on this thing. So, um, and I thought I could land a model rocket. I thought, well, th they're doing it with a 20-something story building. I, I could do it on a model rocket, right? I, got, I know how to work with an Arduino. I know how to 3D print things. So I looked it up. I went to the rocketry forum, and I found some comments. This one says, this will never happen for a model rocket, and then uh, furthers it, while it is an interesting thought ex exercise, that is about all it will ever be. And I thought about that a little bit, and I thought, uh, I thought it might be wrong. So <laughs> <laughs> I thought it might be wrong. I bought Rocket Propulsion Elements by George Sutton, a classic aerospace engineering textbook. I went to Starbucks and spent way too much money at Starbucks. I should have gone to the library. Uh, I went to Starbucks almost every day and, and sort of made a, a really uh, rigid habit out of studying this book, doing the examples, reading, reading through these chapters and printing it down. And then you can see uh, I bought an Arduino kit. I bought a, a 3D printer. Um, and I got to work. So on the, on the top right is a, is a quick test of uh, the thrust vectoring mount. This is just one axis of vectoring right now. Um, using a little accelerometer and a gyroscope and a little solderless breadboard. Down below is a, is a more advanced uh, iteration of that, you know, by like a week or so. Um, running a uh, 90 degrees offset sine wave uh, through each axis um, of the TBC mount. So um, I started making progress and, and about a month into the project, this is about fall of 2015, um, we were ready for our first launch. So here it is, this is Scout V0.1. And so the, the problem with this is that it, it, it was supposed to go up, <laughs> and it, it doesn't happen so, it, doesn't, it didn't do it so well. Um, and so what actually happened here is um, the mechanical stress uh, on the servos that were uh, actuating the thrust vectoring mount was too great. Um, and not being a mechanical engineer, just doing trial by fire, I didn't know this, and, uh, and that is the result. So we went back to the drawing board. I took my uh, thrust vectoring mount design, and I beefed up the servos. I did the most simple thing possible. I made them bigger. Um, and so here's Scout V0.2 on October 21st of 2015. Up it goes. And we're, oh. We're coming over, and there's that problem again, right? We're trying to go up, and, and we're not quite getting it. Uh, <laughs> so this is a really interesting problem, actually. This, was, this is a, a tough one. So the mount is locked in place during this flight, right? The, mount, it's, the motor is stationary. And the problem here is actually in the stability software. So um, I'll, I'll give you some insight into what happened. Um, for this test, I was using uh, what's called an accelerometer to um, to determine the rocket's orientation. And so the way that this works is there's, there are three axes of acceleration measurements going on. And when you're on the ground, standing still, you can always feel um, what is 9.8 meters per second squared uh, forcing down on you. And that's gravity. That's a, that's a constant, right? And so if you use that on a stationary object, you can always determine what your orientation is. But if you start to move, if you start to move under thrust in a certain direction, your gravity measurements are no longer reliable. And this is, it's, hard to, it's hard to think about this without actually having it happen first. <laughs> and that is, that is what happened to me. So anyway, I, I uh, went back to the drawing board. I, I uh, incorporated a gyroscope. Uh, that's an angular uh, momentum sensor. Um, I think that's correct. It's an angular momentum sensor uh, into the uh, stability software. And Scout V0.3 in December of uh, 2015 so this one, we're going up, and actually, this is, this is one of my favorite tests. This is the first time I, I got to see the thrust vectoring mount do some work in the air. It doesn't work very well, to be clear. I mean, we're, we're coming back down now, but <laughs> it, this is the first time that, that the system really uh, started to prove that it was possible. So, so I saw this test, I looked at this, this high-speed footage, and I thought, all right, well, it's time, to, it's time to scale up. We need to add more things to this rocket. <laughs> That's the way to do it, right? So we've got uh, landing legs on the right. I developed a spring-loaded landing leg system that when the legs fold out, they lock in place. I built a flight computer. Um, that's just a little, um, I think it's called a prototyping board, but basically you have wires in the back and you solder it in place. It's a little bit better than a solderless breadboard so the vibration doesn't induce any uh, <coughs> connection errors during, during flight. And then on the right there, it's a little bit hard to see with the projector, but those are um, deployable fins that induce drag at the top of the vehicle. And so what we're trying to do with those 
is have the rocket come down straight. Have the rocket come down entirely vertical. Um, and so by shifting the center of pressure up very high, you can, you can drop the rocket um, and have it not flop about. Because they're inherently unstable. So this is uh, Scout V0.4. This is actually, if any of you are familiar with the rocket noob, uh, he actually helped film this launch uh, in, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, so we're, we ascend to about 16 meters here. And then when the rocket detects that we're past apogee, there go the drag fins. And that's it, folks. That's the landing right there. We landed. <laughs> the motor was still burning. We were under propulsion. <laughs> so uh, this test, this, this, was, this was also an exciting test for me. I think this is actually what you were discussing earlier. This, I posted this, this everywhere. I was really excited about it. And um, so you might think, you look at this footage, and it's like, oh, well, he's really close. Like, it's, this is really close, right? It, it's coming down. It's like pretty straight. We should have put the legs out, but, and it's pretty close. We just, we had a little bit too much speed. And actually, that's deceptive. I launched Scout five more times, and each time I had just tiny little errors that, that would cause things to fail. And so with rockets, you all know this, you all fly rockets. It's like one thing, like it only takes one thing for it to go wrong, and it doesn't, it doesn't go a little bit wrong. Like you don't kind of, you don't get like a B. You like fail the test entirely. <laughs> so, so it took it took five more launches before I decided that is enough. I am not testing in this style anymore. We needed a, we needed a new linear style of testing, a, a more incremental way of working up to this big challenge of propulsively landing a model rocket. Because I I was getting kind of sick of seeing these images, especially as the person who would spend days building these rockets. Right. So, uh, in comes Echo. Echo. Uh, a, uh, Echo was about the same size of Scout, uh, but we added parachutes on the top, just radially mounted, nothing super fancy, and then deployed with a nichrome wire and a rubber band that releases them. Um, actually, I think that's used in a number of water rockets as well. But, um, and then in the bottom, it's, it is a little bit hard to see with the, um, with the projector here, but we added a plastic skirt as well, and that was to reinforce um, some of the structural integrity of the bottom of the rocket so that if we hit the ground hard at all, even if the chutes didn't work, right, we're trying to like, this is, try this is like the contingency rocket. Even if everything doesn't work, when it hits the ground, it's going to stay intact instead of, you know, exhibit this behavior. Um, <laughs> so here's some uh, footage from the ECHO program. We launched ECHO nine times with a lot of success, actually. So what, what happened during this program um, in about the fall of 2016 now, um, was we were able to really dial in how we get orientation measurements during flight. Um, and so that's pretty important. We went through several different um, inertial measurement units, that's IMUs, um, during, the, during this test series. Uh, we refined some of the thrust vectoring mounts, so sort of made improvements to make it easier to build, easier to manufacture. You can see it's really, uh, this is, so, I'm going to keep saying this, but these are just like my favorite shots. They're so beautiful, and it, it really doesn't get old for me. Um, you know, it looks just like the real thing. So, moving on. Sometimes, sometimes rockets don't work well, and it takes a little bit of a reminder, because we forget that things can fail. This is a comparison that I like to make between um, a proton rocket launch from Russia in, in 2013. Yeah, see, he, he already knows. <laughs> and this is Echo. This is the fourth time we launched the Echo vehicle um, uh, in, in 2016. And uh, some of you already know what happens, but Echo had a wire stuck in the uh, TVC mount, so we couldn't move the motor. Someone stalled a sensor upside down in the proton. Both silly errors. Both silly errors. And uh, Echo senses something's wrong, deploys the chutes. It's coming down safely. There are no parachutes on the proton, though. Ooh. Yeah, that's a little rough. <laughs> so it's always kind of fun to make that comparison. I mean, really, these are, these are fundamentally, uh, you know, these are fundamentally, like, vastly different rockets. But I always kind of find it fun because the footage looks really cool. Um, so after the ECHO program, after a couple more of those issues where it was silly, I decided it was, it was time to uh, introduce a new vehicle into the fleet. This is Relay. Um, Relay, again, all of these are about the same size, about a meter tall. Um, Relay was focused on making a lot of these components that the rocket flies with lighter, 
Um, and uh, once again, easier to build. So lighter is important because if we're going to try to land a model rocket, it's, I mean, in any case with rockets, every gram counts basically. Um, so this was to optimize that. Um, we st I started, uh, I built a new thrust vectoring mount that could accommodate both a ascent motor and a retro propulsion motor. Um, and I'll show a test of that here. So here we have our ascent motor. You can see a thrust vectoring test at the bottom. We're actuating to 3.3 .3 degrees and then 6.6 .6 on each axis, plus or minus. And then once the motor burns out, it's going to hang out there for a second. And then it's going to get real fiery. So this is the retro motor. Once again, you can see the retro motor vectoring. These are mounted in the same mount stacked on top of each other. Um, so this, is, this, was, this actually still remains to be uh, what I think is the best option for how to um, land a model rocket. You have, basically, it's hot staging, right? So the Soyuz vehicle, uh, also from Russia, uses hot st staging in their second stage where the motor lights and then something separates from it. Anyway, that was something cool. And then uh, here's some, some beautiful footage from, um, from a few of the relay launches. Um, really kind of evokes the Saturn V camera from like some of these Apollo missions. And um, so something that I realized during the relay program, right? I, I said we had made things lighter, we had made things better, um, like easier to build. And something that I realized is I had been getting requests through the website and uh, other places to build a, a kit for these rockets. And I, I actually kind of dismissed it initially as being ridiculous. Like these rockets would take multiple days to make. And uh, to give you a sense of, of what that was like, between, at like, even after it had come out of the 3D printer, getting all of the parts to work together for one of these thrust vectoring mounts took seven-ish hours uh, initially. And by relay, I had gotten it down to about, to about 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and it actually, it actually got a lot better than that recently. But um, uh, yeah, it, I had sort of streamlined this process. And I figured, well, it might be time to scale up again. Maybe it's time to put, put propulsive landing on hold and, and see what we can do with this kit thing. Um, so that's what I did. I decided I needed some help, though. I, I had never designed a PCB before. That's a printed circuit board. And that's a really great way to, again, save more mass and then make it more easily producible as well. So I enlisted the help of several of my friends. This is Arsenio. Uh, Arsenio does um, fin-based rocket stability and works at NASA Goddard. He's a, also like a wizard in PCB design. So I enlisted his help. Um, Thomas, who is uh, excellent at branding, he's actually here somewhere today. Uh, he, he was, he's been doing the branding for uh, a lot of the BPS stuff. And then Charlie Garcia, who's uh, MIT and SpaceX, uh, who helped me really dial in the mechanical engineering um, of these thrust vectoring mounts. So this is the process of designing a PCB. Um, it takes a long time. And it's actually not that hard. It's just extremely tedious. If any of you are electrical engineers in here, it's just super tedious. Um, so, uh, and then at the end of it, once the boards get manufactured, they were really beautiful. This is the first revision. You can actually see it if uh, you come down to the BPS booth uh, later. We have all of these boards in chronological order um, of how we produce them and sort of the process of doing this. So, um, here's that. We uh, refined the TBC mount design. This is a shot uh, just straight on of the most recent design uh, that, uh, that we've been working with. Uh, super reliable. Uh, accuracy up to about a quarter of a degree, um, which means that even if your uh, linkages, I don't know how detailed you want to get, but even if your linkages are not uh, super tight or super uh, like in line, you can use the servos position to actually zero out the mount to a really high degree, and that's important. Um, I also started dialing in uh, the, the method for tuning these rockets. So the best way for me to describe this is it's, it's actually a lot like uh, using open rocket to find your stability caliber, or doing even even just a rudimentary swing test around your head with a rocket uh, or by its center of mass to sort of find out if it's going to fly well. And so this is a similar thing. What we do is we're trying to find the inertia of the rocket, or basically um, we're trying to find how the rocket behaves when we have a, act a given force against it. And so this is called a bifilar pendulum test. This is used uh, in a lot of NASA aircraft, actually. Um, and what you do is you rotate the rocket back and forth around its center of mass, and then you calculate what the average sine wave time is, what the average period of the wave is. And so that's what I started doing in the summer. I had previously sort of been guessing the numbers, just educated guesses based on what had worked and what had not in, in previous flights. And this was a mathematically correct way to do it, which I figured was 
a better thing uh, as we were moving forward. And so here is an example of what it looks like in the computer. The blue line represents the rocket's orientation simulated, and the red line represents the TVCs, the thrust factoring mounts, uh, orientation as well to correct for the rocket's position. This is actually a pretty poorly tuned model, but this is a good example of what it looks like. Um, and then this is a good example of what it looks like in real life. So there are two tests here. You have test number one and number two, and they are, they are a bit different. Number one is a little bit wiggly, and this is the test where it's, a, it's essentially a control. This is how I used to tune uh, these rockets and used to find the values for how the rocket would keep itself on, on course. <clears throat> and then test number two uses the mathematically correct way that I just discussed, too. And, and the difference is significant. This one is really rock solid here. Um, here's another example of that. This is a step test um, going between zero degrees, to entirely upright, to about five degrees pitched over. Um, and then there's a set, several other angles here. You can see about midway through the burn, the rocket sort of pitches over a little bit. So that's to find the response. This one was a little bit wiggly. I intentionally misaligned the thrust vectoring mount just to understand how it would work in a non-ideal scenario. And then we, uh, I simulated this test as well. This is the same thing as before. And then this is the observed rocket response. This is the data from the test. And so you know, you'll notice it's not exactly quite right. We have a lot of factors that are going into these tests. But for the most part, this is actually quite accurate. Um, the real life results really mimicked the, um, the measured results. OK. I got into piston-based ejection as well. I figured that was a, a better way to deploy parachutes instead of strapping them with rubber bands to the outside of the rocket. Um, it certainly looks better. And it's actually quite reliable, too. I'm, I'm really fond of the piston ejection method, too. I think it's used a lot in high power rockets, but I haven't seen it too much in low power stuff. Um, and then uh, in July, right before we were about to uh, fly our rocket, we had been doing a lot of work on stability software. Um, we got the new revision of the signal board in. This, is, this had a lot of updates, a lot of new features. Um, for, for a time, we actually included outputs for um, fin-based stability as well, although that it, it actually turns out to be extremely hard to do fin-based, like far harder than TVC. Um, and at that point, we were ready for our first flight. I love that, that little kid screaming, yeah. So I'll walk you through what uh, happens, what the flight profile looks like for the uh, signal avionics system. We've got ignition on the pad. And then watch closely over, over in this area. You'll see the rocket, the avionics bay turns red. And that's the flight computer actually recognizing that liftoff has occurred. And so we can actually save a lot of power by not vectoring the thrust when we're on the pad, right? Because why do you need that? And um, so that's what's happening. The rocket detects liftoff and then begins its uh, flight mode. Um, signal moves through several different states. Um, this state is going from apogee to uh, free fall, basically. And the reason we have the rocket detect all of these different states is we can sort of prioritize different functions, right? So number one priority in when we're under powered flight is thrust vectoring. But as the flight goes on, that becomes less important. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the reasoning behind that. And then we also got into um, some more advanced uh, stability software. It's not technically guidance, but it's, it's, it's extremely advanced stability stuff. So um, Signal uses something called, um, this, this version of Signal uses uh, something called Euler angles and um, direction cosine matrices. And <clears throat> I'll save you the benefit of going through the nightmare of direction cosine matrices, but uh, what this means is that signal is able to, no matter the role of the vehicle, correct for its orientation. You'll see it's pretty locked in at that pitched over orientation at the beginning of flight, and that over time it reorients to vertical. And this is really difficult to do when the rocket is rolling in this way, um, because as the rocket rolls, your X and Y axes actually trade off both positive and negative and with each other where the motor should be pointed. Around this time, we were ready um, to produce our first commercially available version of Signal, uh, Signal Avionics. This is called Signal Alpha. Uh, this is the first version that we uh, produced. And these are uh, likely in the hands of some happy rocketeer. Um, we sold out in, in November and uh, shipped a bunch of them off. Um, and 
We also shipped out a bunch of user manuals, tuning instructions for how to do all of these sort of complex procedures without you know, doing all of the math behind it or having to do a bunch of research as well. Um, and then produced a about 40 minute video series on how to go from having no rocket to flying that rocket with thrust vector control and the signal alpha system. And so that about brings us up to today. Um, and I want to quickly uh, just mention some of the things that we're working on for the future. Um, so this is signal R2. Um, you just call it signal. I'm actually pretty undecided on the name of it. But um, this is a entirely upgraded version of the signal avionics system. The biggest thing that you actually can't see is we've switched from uh, direction cosine matrices for an orientation method to something called quat quaternions. Um, and <laughs> they are extremely complicated. I won't get into it today. Um, but the space shuttle uses them. And I think most aerospace vehicles actually do as well. Um, so it's super advanced, and it lets you avoid gimbal lock, which is great. Uh, we're working on the signal configuration app. Uh, the new flight computer also has Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth radio in it, um, so that you can configure the rocket on the pad in the field with your phone. Right? You don't want to have to bring a laptop out to the field, and um, and then you can be you can be able to uh, view flight data immediately after your flight to see how it performed as well. Oh, hold on. I am also working on a, uh, a new build of a Falcon Heavy model. Um, and so I'll play a, a quick clip of that now. This model uses four different flight computers, uh, four different thrust vectoring mounts. I suppose you could say four stages. Once again, quaternion-based guidance. A number of separation events. We performed a static fire about two weeks ago uh, just to test out the pad and some of the data logging features. So that is coming in uh, the spring of 2018, um, just a build that I'm really excited about. Uh, it's, it is phenomenally complicated and uh, <laughs> yeah, when Elon Musk says Falcon Heavy turned out to be harder than you think, that is true at the model scale as well. <laughs> um, also coming up is propulsive landing. We are still working on this. This is from a test, actually, um, last summer, uh, an airborne landing, essentially, with shoots out in a safe way so that we don't hurt the rocket by slamming it into the ground if we miss our math. Um, and so this shows the rocket sort of reorienting, slowing down to a zero, uh, zero speed. Um, so that's coming. Once again, it turns out to be <laughs> extremely hard to do, but that's coming. We are we're working toward that. So I want to talk about um, I want to talk about one more thing today, and I I think I think it's perhaps the most important part. Um, so you might sort of think to yourself why thrust vectoring would would want to be would be useful in model rockets anyway. Um, and apart from that, it's cool, which is not wrong. It is super cool. Right? Why, why would you use this in a model rocket? What would, what would the purpose be? Because there's perhaps nothing more simple than like the three fins and a nose cone concept. Um, right? And so this is, this is what I think about that. I, I, I took a look at um, a few modeling industries. And so you'll have to bear with me for a second while we go through that. Um, but I want to I wanna sort of put forth that model rocketry actually has uh, tremendous potential to grow in like a new way with thrust vector control. So let's, let's go over that. I've, I've identified that every modeling industry essentially works um, in, a, in a Venn diagram of sorts. So you have form and function. So form represents aesthetics. Um, that These are models that look like the real thing. And, and function is mo are models that work like the real thing, using the real physics world um, to to do their job. So looking at uh, model airplanes in, in the form category, you actually can't see it well with the projector, but um, this is a desk model of a plane, um, of a nice jet. And uh, over in the function column, you have something like this, this plane, which hit the Guinness World Records for uh, speed. And this is actually on the extreme end of it, but um, these are two polar opposites for, for um, model aircraft. And basically, this covers form. This is a highly detailed model, but it can't fly. And this covers function. This is an entirely unrealistic model, but it can fly, and it can do it 
super fast. It's crazy. You should look it up on YouTube. Um, okay, and so essentially you have this convergence between these, these circles and you expect that there's, there is some appreciable market uh, or community rather in between them. And actually, as it turns out, it is most of the community that wants form and function in, in their vehicles. Um, right, so let's, let's take this again with model cars. We have, once again, the, the desk model of this lovely red Porsche. Um, and then in function, we have this like uh, nitrous-fueled rage on wheels. I don't know what you want to call this. but um, And once again, as it turns out, the form and function still remains true. The, the, the vast majority of the community is, is interested in um, something that looks and works like the real thing. This is a remote-controlled Porsche. I don't know why they're both Porsches, actually. I didn't notice that. Um, and this is actually entirely true in model railroads, too, it, almost to an extreme. The, the model railroading industry exists like solely in between these two circles. There are almost no fringe cases for this. And so I found this to be a really good metaphor. So I want to, I want to bring it to model rocketry and sort of analyze what is, what is happening here. On the left, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar, there's a gentleman named Ollie Braun from Buzz Space Models um, who builds these like beautiful models. I mean, maybe more realistic than the real thing. I, it's, it's, it's quite impressive. He builds these beautiful models, but of course they, they cannot fly. They're pretty delicate and you know, they're, they're kind of hard to build. And then on the other end, you have your traditional sort of three fins and a nose cone, right? And this doesn't actually model anything in real life, um, although it does work like the real thing using actual propulsion and going up. And what I, what I would put forth today is that actually um, thrust vector control may, may allow this middle section to sort of exist um, in the way that you no longer have to lift off the pad and, and hit 200 feet in about a half a second. You can actually model a Saturn V taking five seconds to clear the pad um, by, by rising very slowly. You don't need aerodynamic stability. Um, and I, I, I would also add that um, we are working on uh, some motor development things as well to uh, uh, build some longer burning motors right now. So long burning sort of consists of between three and seven seconds. And we've been able to uh, more than double that um, in a few tests. So I want to, I want to, I want to bring this home really quickly. Um, I mentioned earlier that I, I studied music in college and I love videography and, um, and of course I love model rockets and engineering. And um, rarely do I get to sort of combine all three of those things together in a useful way that, that is satisfying. And um, this morning I actually did. Um, I put out this video that I, I wrote the music for and I um, shot the video for and I built, of course, the rockets in it and I'd like to uh, play that for you now. All range personnel be advised, rockets and charges are armed. GSE, confirm ground flight status. GSE is locked. Flight off status check, return go or no go for launch. Flight out is guy. Oh, it's time to go. RSO, range is green. Go flight. All flight and range ops are go, locking in for terminal count. So those are the things that I'm working on. These are, that's some, uh, some lovely footage of it happening. And um, that is what I have for you today. Thank you for your time. Nobody's got any questions, right? <laughs>
you have time for a few questions? I have time for as many as you want. <laughs> OK. Randy. What kind of motors were you using? <laughs> <laughs> yes. The motor is, is uh, it's based on an F15 by Estes. We're trying to hit about, in, these, in most of these tests, I, I assume you're talking about the ones with lots of fire underneath them. Well, any of them. They look like black powder motors. Some of them are, yeah. So we're using uh, <clears throat> some of the APCP motors we use are uh, the uh, Apogee F10. That's an excellent motor, by the way. I love that thing. Um, and uh, then the other ones are an F15 equivalent. Um, so hitting around an average. Between the F10 and the F15, really what we're trying to do is, is hit that like 10 to 15 Newton range. Because most of these rockets end up about being about one kilogram. And then for that slow liftoff, you basically want to just just get your like thrust to weight ratio right above gravity. So those are those that's the answer. And then I'll I'll further that by saying if you are interested in achieving the, the amount of fire under the motor, launching at dusk is like the best thing ever. <laughs> uh, it's it's incredible the relative difference in light uh, between the motor and like a really beautiful pink or purple sky. Yeah. So what what's your plan for right? Assume is a lack of throttling for the uh, landing, right? Because the main problems that I see are consistent ignition at the right time, and how do you, you know, there's going to be variables where you don't ignite it at the right time, and how do you land it without uh, throttle? How do you, what, what's your plan for throttling or lack of throttling? Sure. So, um, Regarding the ignition timing issue, um, you're not wrong that there's, there is, in, in some motors, specifically APCP motors, ignition timing is a real pain uh, to deal with. And not just for retropropulsion, retro -propulsion, uh, and, but with black powder motors, motors it's, it's actually a good deal more reliable. I did a bunch of testing with my friend uh, Johnny out in California um, this summer where we, we essentially characterized with the specific igniters that I'm using, the specific motors that I'm using, and the speci specific igniter holders that I'm using, we characterize the time from um, a current being sent to the igniter to uh, the motor beginning to actually burn and mimic the thrust curve. And so we characterize it at about um, 20 milliseconds, a little bit under 20 milliseconds. And so um, I actually, I'm, not, I'm pretty confident we can get um, a decent accuracy in our timing. But the other thing you might be wondering is, well, what about, there's, there's typically about a 5% difference in thrust between motors, right? You can't just get perfect builds that mimic the thrust curve exactly every time. And so the way that we deal with that, I actually have talked with uh, the gentleman I mentioned, Charlie, uh, the MIT and SpaceX guy. Um, we've been talking about this, and I think the solution lies in actually having um, a set of either two or four outboard A-level motors that are not thrust vectored, they don't really need to be, and it's sort of like a Soyuz style capsule landing, right? So at the last second, you, well, with the Soyuz capsule, at the last second, you have the motors fire right, right above the ground to sort of soften the impact. And we'd be using them in a different way. The flight computer would be uh, basically analyzing things during the flight and uh, would trigger those motors at the right time so that we could add any thrust that we need, and we would slightly underspec the motor instead. Does that make sense? Because essentially what, what you want to do is have just like slightly too little thrust in that scenario, so that if your motor overperforms, you don't need to burn those motors. If your motor performs accurately, you need to burn only one set. If you underperform, you can burn two. Um, not very, yeah, that's the answer. Is, is not, they're not very statically stable. They're inherently unstable rockets, just kind of like the real thing. And so <clears throat> what I'm banking on is uh, having access to lots of longer burning motors in the future, right? So we kind of have to work with this 3.5 second limit or seven second limit in burn time. Um, but with these longer burning motors that we're working on, basically um, the goal is to keep our flights really low and slow and almost entirely under thrust, just like the real thing. Like a, a big part of what I'm trying to do is, is make model rockets look and fly just like the real life prototypes. So they certainly do tumble after burnout and that's something that's like a growing pain, I think, of the technology. In 
your kits when you sell them, what motor do you recommend to put them in? So there are several motors. Uh, the E9P, the E9 has a, a bit of a storied history, but uh, the E9 plugged motor, there are several other plugged alternatives. Um, they are very few. Um, there are very few plugged motors that we have been able to recommend, correct? Because modifying motors is against the NIR code. Um, and what I'd really like to see is more plugged variants available for this type of situation. But right now, it's, it's just a few motors, a couple of APCP motors, and, um, and that E9. The E9, and uh, I think there may be an F equivalent motor too, but generally it's just plug motors. Um, these flight computers have been able to tolerate some erroneous ejection charges that have fired at them, but it's really not good to do. They've been able to take it, but it's, you shouldn't try to fire a bunch of exhaust at a computer. <laughs> sure. Okay, I'll go the non-technical route. So what's your capital expenditure to date? Have you tried to attract any you don't want to know what my capital expenditure to date is, and neither do I. <laughs> well, I do, but you may not. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, to date, I can't give you, uh, well, uh, more, I don't want to give you a number, but I, I think I know it. Um, and then, uh, right now, we've actually, so you, essentially, your, your question is about funding, right? Yeah, so, have, you, have you gone after any? Well, it's a, it's a tricky situation. So we started off, well, we, I, I started off um, doing, this, doing this on the side, right? And, you know, model, like the, the old adage is, if you want to make a small fortune in yeah, rockets, start with a large, you start with a large fortune, like right? Okay. Yeah. So, um, so we started off with this project on the side. And then as expenses grew, kind of around the relay point that I talked about, around the relay point where we started to uh, do more heavy development and launch less, I started uh, a Patreon page, actually, um, to help fund expenses like that. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't cover any full-time stuff like that or um, any, of, any of those, but it does help even out. So we're still sort of at that phase. And we're, we're certainly looking for options to grow, um, but right now it's, it's just been through the generosity of a lot of uh, really wonderful people who have been able to help out. Yeah. Have you heard from Elon? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so <laughs> it, it's like a it's like a good news bad news type. Of thing. <laughs> so here's what happened. Uh, uh, the Echo program, that's the the darker colored rocket um, that uh, it's like in between the Scout and Relay rockets. At the end of the Echo program, we had a live stream of one of the launches, and it was hands down like the worst launch to date. Uh, the TVC mount, the thrust vectoring mount, got misaligned in the car. We have since fixed the issue, by the way. It's, that doesn't happen anymore. But um, uh, the, the thrust vector mount got misaligned in the car, and I did not catch it in the pre-flight checks. And since it was live streamed, it just happened, right? And someone, uh, someone at SpaceX saw that and was like, this is really cool. This guy's trying this really hard thing and did not know that I had other more successful flights. And he sent it to Elon, and Elon sent back, I don't have the screenshot here, but Elon sent him back an email that said, cool, he should work at SpaceX. Um, but so far, so far it has not panned out. <laughs> yeah, so I think, I think the answer is yes. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, come on, guys. Oh, there we go. Can, can you not go off hitch? Sorry? Mix the, mix the yaw hitch on your gimbal. Instead of just going one way and the other way, it's sort of a 3D thing. Uh, you certainly can, yeah. So the motor will actuate in any direction that combines either yaw or pitch. Now, it can't control roll. The, well, the Falcon Heavy actually can control roll because it has three. But um, in, a, in the thrust vectoring mounts that were largely seen here, it's just yaw and pitch. But they can be mixed. So if you're 10 degrees over on the yaw axis and you're 10 degrees over on the pitch axis, the rocket sees that and, and actuates both parts of the mount. It's not, it, they're not isolated. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. I didn't see that in the video or what I thought, but. but well, okay. so co come by to the booth, actually. We have a bunch of thrust vectoring mounts there. We have a lot of the, the, all, the whole development process of the flight computers, a little couple of demo things. The second stage for the Falcon Heavy is here, too. Yeah. What kind of uh, reception are you getting in the model rocket community? It's generally it falls into one of two categories. 
One is, this is illegal. <laughs> and it's, it is, it's not, but those conversations happen more often than I would like. Um, and the other one is, the other one is like you said, you, it, it, was, it was like, wow, this is really cool. And, and really what I'm excited about is to see if I can, see if I can figure out if the Venn diagram thing I was talking about actually exists. I, I think it does, and that would be the ultimate perception, would be to, to see if there's interest for these models that work and fly like the real thing. So, yeah, the, both of those. So, Joe, thank you. Yeah. That was fantastic. Thank you. So, if, if I could take just a moment here. Are, are, are Vern and Bleed in here? They got it back out. They just, they just stepped out. How about uh, Betty and Lee? They're here. We've got, we've got the early history of our hobby right here. Gary, are you in here? Where's Gary Rosenfield? Where's John Beats? Right here. That's kind of like the current state of our hobby right now. I think, the, I think the shoot release is the coolest product somebody's put out since the black powder motor. The shoot release, <laughs> yeah. And then with Joe and his work here, I think we're looking at the future, one potential future for our hobby. So I think it's just fantastic that we've been able to bring all that together in, in this room today. And I, I genuinely thank you for making that happen. Thanks for having me, okay. certainly. Yeah.